This morning I want to speak to you just for a few moments about the Christmas story. Because in a few days we're going to gather around the Christmas tree. And we're going to open up some gifts. And some of those gifts are going to amaze us and some of those gifts are going to disappoint us. But if we take time today to unwrap the Christmas story and really connect with it, we'll walk away from the manger, we'll walk away from this powerful story, I believe, with, with a sense of awe and a sense of satisfaction and a sense of determination to really understand who this Christ child is. Now, I love the Christmas story. It never gets old. It, it never loses its mystique. It never loses its power to change a life. It never loses its power to bring back some really important, lasting, important things that we should always remember around Christmas. I, I love the, the story of Christmas because it's a real story. And I think that tradition in so many ways has, has left out some really important, powerful truths. And I think that there are a lot of people, probably millions of people that are accustomed to the seeing the manger scene, hearing the Christmas story, seeing certain Christmas figures that are found in the Bible, and they miss the opportunity to really see the glory of Christmas, the life-changing power of this incredible story. And the truth is the Christmas story has real people. It's a, it's a story about real people encountering a real God that came down from a real heaven that, that, that was born in a real manger and that we can see a way in the manger, a way in the manger for mankind to find God's love, a way in the manger to find God's compassion, a way in the manger to find God's humility, his grace, his comfort, his power and his glory. The Christmas story is a story about real people in real situations with a real God doing some real, really powerful things in the lives of some desperate people. The, the Christmas story is a story about a, a young teenage girl who is not pregnant on her own, but she is impregnated by the Spirit of the Lord, and, and she is absolutely in awe and afraid, and she's desperate, and she can't understand what is happening, but the angel says, with God, all things are possible. The, the Christmas story is a, is a story about a, a young man who, who finds out that his, his teenage uh, fiancé is pregnant, and he wasn't the one, and, and now he's got to deal with the shame of it all and, and trying to wrestle through it all until he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Joseph, it's going to be all right. It, it's a real story about real people in, in desperate situations. And, and I want you to know the Christmas story is a story that can change our life today. It's not just a story about Jesus being born. It's a story of the Son of God. It's the story of the creator of the universe, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, entering into human situations and interacting and choosing uh, to be just like us so that we can understand that we have a high priest that can feel our pain, our, our sorrow, our loss, our struggles, our temptation our questions, everything. You see, I think the Christmas story is not only really powerful because it reveals God's incredible love for mankind by him becoming a man and living and dying on the cross, but it also it reveals that God can touch. God can once again reveal. God can connect. God can use ordinary people to unfold history so that we can see a God who's interested in every part of our lives. 
And I believe this morning, if we peer into the story of Christmas once again, we'll see some powerful things. And so I want us to look in, into the story of Christmas found in Matthew. There's, there's two Gospels that talk about the story of Christmas, and, and Luke actually unfolds it in a detailed way. That's the way that Luke saw things. You know, he was a doctor, and he would just detail everything. But, but Matthew, he's actually writing to the Jews, and, and, and Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus because he's got to prove that Jesus came from a certain line. And so we recognize that, that Matthew is speaking to the Jewish people. And I want you to look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And it says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Wow, man, I'm telling you what, that must have freaked him out. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the king, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who had been born king of the Jews? We saw his star and when it rose and had come, we have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, do you ever wonder why uh, there was such a ruckus, there was such a disturbance in Jerusalem when the, 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 the Magi came? Well, we have this idea, we have this picture of the Magi that only three came. You know, we have this picture of these old men who kind of came, we three kings of the, you know, and they just came and went, walked in and, and kind of just was talking to King Herod, but that's not what happened. When they came in, they were men of prominence. They were great men of prominence. And so they came with an entourage. They came with a whole army. They came with all kinds of servants. They came with all kinds of stuff. This was a big scene. This was not just a little scene. But when they rode into Jerusalem, they came with all these mighty horses and all these mighty warriors and soldiers. And they said, we want to know. We saw a star and we want to know where that, that king is. And, and Herod was so co concerned about it and disturbed. Why? Because Herod it was a king and he didn't want to be disposed in any way he didn't want this king to take over his place and so not only was he disturbed but all of Jerusalem was disturbed by this scene can you imagine if we were in church right now in Valley Stream and all of a sudden somebody came in with tanks with a bunch of tanks and military men and said we're looking for Pastor Steve that would pretty much be disturbing to at least my wife and my kids and this is what happens here. It's a big scene. It's an incredible scene. It's an amazing scene that's actually unfolding in front of all of Jerusalem. And when he had called together all the, peop uh, the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, you see, King Herod wasn't a Jew. He acted like a Jew, but he wasn't a Jew. Not, not saying that he lived like a Jew, but he wanted the Jews to actually accept him. He was a puppet in the hands of the Roman emperor. And so he would actually try to do everything he can to please the Jews. And that's why he made a big temple for the Jews and all of that. But at some point they got under his skin and there were times when he really had a hard time with the Jews. But for most part, he was a political puppet and he wanted to be king, right? And so here we find that now he calls 
calls in the Jewish people, he calls in the leaders, the Jewish leaders, he calls in the Jewish priests and, and the, the people of the law, and he wants to find out, well, what does the scripture say? What, 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 are, what does your scripture say about all of this? Because these, these kings are saying that, uh, or these magis are saying that there is a, supposed to be a Messiah, there's supposed to be a king that's come, and so he, he wants to find out about it, and so he asked them where the Messiah would be born, and they, they said, well, we know Micah chapter 5 says in Bethlehem in Judea they replied for this is what the prophet had written but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the ruler of Judah for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared where did it appear how did it appear and he sent them to Bethlehem and said go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find him report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Herod had no plans of worshiping this child. Herod wanted to find out where this child was so he can kill the child. Why? Because he wanted to be king and he didn't want anybody else to be king. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Everybody say, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country another way. So Matthew actually skips over a lot of what Luke talks about in the Christmas scene. We don't hear anything about shepherds. We, we really don't have a whole lot about what happened in the manger. So, uh, so the truth is that Matthew, appealing to the Jews, he's actually skipping over a lot of the manger scene. And now he goes to Matthew chapter 2, and he starts to talk about these magis. He, he skips the whole story of the inn, and he, and he, and he brings us... Babylon, what, a, uh, it, what is now a really modern day Iraq. And so, so he brings us to a place, he, he actually passes through a lot of the story, and he brings us to a place where he, he unfolds a story that's actually happening in Babylon. And it's happening with magicians or, or astrologers or, or even, uh, as we can uh, know today, scientists. And these wise men, these scientists, these astrologers, see a star and they recognize that this is a very special star. Now, I want you to know that some theologians even believe that it could have been actually the pillar of fire. It could have looked like a star, but it could have been the pillar of fire, that same pillar of fire that led the people of Israel from one place to the next place in the desert. But whatever it was, it was some kind of a star or a pillar of fire. Now, it's interesting to note that these wise men were from Babylon. That's really, really, really important. At least, you see, I want you to know that God doesn't ever do anything by accident. Everything in history, everything that happens in history, is, it happens for a reason. And God knows. We, we might look at the things that are happening in our world today, and we might be so confused about it. We might look at the political world. We might look at all the things that are happening in the Middle East, and we might get afraid. Why? Because we think, wow, all these things are happening randomly. All these things are happening by by the will of man. I want you to know that God is on the throne. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's a sovereign God. He's a wise God. He knows the times and the seasons of all things. He plans out everything and he uses men like a puppet. Come on, somebody. He uses men as he wills so that his will will be done in this world. Amen. And so now we look years back. We look years, years back and we find that Babylon is a place where God begins to do his work and we can't see it why because all we can see is the people of Israel being carted off to Babylon why because they were rebellious how many know that God even uses rebellious people 
And the Bible says that, that because of the people's rebellion, because they would not listen to the Lord, and you know, I've been reading actually and listening to 1 Kings uh, and 2 Kings and Chronicles, and it's the story of all the kings of Israel. It's a story about a good king, David, and how he did everything the Lord wanted him to do except for a couple of mistakes that he made, sins that he made in his life. But the Bible says his heart was toward the Lord. He had a heart that was after God, and there was no man like David. He loved God with all of his heart and the Bible tells us that his sons that followed after him did wickedness even Solomon did great wickedness and and it's a really it's a list of a story of uh, of all these kings that were rebellious and how because of their rebellion uh, God allowed them to be taken captive to the Babylonians for 70 years and when they were captive in in Babylon for 70 years there were several young men who really loved God and they they choose not to defile themselves and even though Nebuchadnezzar changed their names, they, they knew who they were. You know, they were the three Hebrew young men who were thrown in the fire. And Daniel. And Daniel is a young man with incredible integrity. He's a, a young man with incredible honor. And the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a vision and it really troubled him. And he called all of the magi together. He called all of the astrologers and scientists together. And he said, listen, I had this vision and you better tell me what this vision is all about and if you don't know what the vision is and if you can't tell me what the vision's about I'm gonna cut off all your heads I'm gonna I'm gonna execute you all and Daniel said well I'm gonna be a part of that because he thinks I'm a magi as well he, he thinks I'm a wise man as well and so I better come up with the vision and so Daniel went into his prayer listen God can give you new visions come on somebody the Bible says in the last days God will give us visions come on somebody God can talk to us God can reveal things to us it's not extra biblical visions outside of of the realm of the scripture but it's always confirmed by the scripture but God wants to still speak to his people come on somebody say amen and Daniel goes into his prayer closet and he, and, he, and he gets the vision and he comes back and he, he shares the vision with the king of Babylon. And you know, through the, through the influence of Daniel, through the influence of these three Hebrew boys, you know the story, you remember the story, the three Hebrew boys went and bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar because he got really high-minded and thought that he was God. And he said, you know, when you hear the music, bow down and worship me. And the three Hebrew boys said, I'm not going to do that. Hey, God, give us young people. God, give us people that will still stand in the midst of a world that is crooked in the midst of a world that is compromising give us people who say I will not bow down to anyone come on somebody say amen glory to God and so the Bible says that they would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar and as a result of that they were thrown in the fire and the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire and he sees that these three Hebrew boys they were not burned up in fact there was one that was dancing in the fire with them friends Jesus will dance in the fire with you come on somebody there's no pop there's no situation that you'll ever go through in your life that Jesus will not stand with you he'll never leave you nor forsake you and Nebuchadnezzar looks in there and he says that surely is God this the son of God and and then he pulled him out and he said there is no other God like your God listen to me God knows exactly what he is doing and so because of those two stories and those two incidents and probably many more Daniel was able to influence the the leaders of Babylon so see this is not a story that's random you know so often we read the story of the Magi and we think it's random we think what what are these people these three kings from the orient how did they see this star why did they see the, they, they were influenced by daniel and they daniel actually because daniel had a, a a place of listen to me i want you to know today that you might feel like you're in an ungodly situation you might feel like nobody's listening to you. You might feel like every day you go to work and you, you, you work around people that don't believe in God, they're atheistic. You'd never know the power of the influence that you have by living your life. Live your life in such a way that people will be influenced by your life, hallelujah. And these people were influenced by Daniel and I believe that Daniel would talk a lot about his God and Daniel would, obviously, Daniel would often talk about the scriptures, the Old Testament, Testament, and he would talk about the prophecies of the Old Testament and these magi were interested in listening to that and 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 I believe that it was passed down from generation to generation to generation so at some point when these magi saw the star they understood this was a special special star 
You see, Galatians chapter 4 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons at the fullness of time. And so now there's the fullness of time that has come, and now we understand that these magis, they see this star, and how do they know that there was supposed to be a special star? Well, there's a couple of scriptures in the Bible that talk about this. Balaam was considered, listen to me, Balaam was considered a magi. Now, Balaam was a, a soothsayer, and um, Balaam would have these prophecies. He was gifted in prophecy. And the Bible tells us that there was a king that wanted to come against the people of Israel. And so he said, Balaam, I want you to, I want you to prophesy against the people of Israel. And he said, I can't do that. Why? Because God's power and God's promise and God's blessings upon the people of Israel. So we know the story. If you're any familiar with the Old Testament, you know that Balaam tricked the people of Israel into sinning. And thus, the people of Israel were cursed because of their own sin. But, but Balaam makes a prophecy. I want you to hear this because now, remember, Balaam lived close to Babylon, and so Balaam was influential also to the Magi's. And so they, they can put all these pieces together. They studied. The Magi's studied many books, but they also studied, in a lot of ways, the Scripture. It says that in, in Balaam was not only considered Magi, but he, he makes this prophecy. Listen to what it says. He says, I, um, he says Behold him but not near, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Tomal. Now, it's really a, a prophecy concerning David, as David is going to overcome the Moabites. But you see, they knew how to put scripture together in some way, because they're also looking at it, and they're seeing that out of David will come one from Judah, the tribe of Judah, that would have a scepter. Out of Judah would come the Messiah. So in one sense, the prophecy applies to Israel itself, particularly in reference to David, but also, we also see the concept of a scepter, a symbol of kingship, referring not only to David, but to David's descendants. And so the scepter, the Bible says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him be obedience of the people. And so Balaam is an ancestor of the wise men of Babylon. And this is how the wise men now understand that there's a special star, and that special star is going to indicate when a special Messiah is to be born. Now, why does Matthew uh, choose not to focus on the Jews at that moment, but to, to focus on the Magi? The Magi were not Jewish. They, they were from Babylon. They were Persians. And, and yet, at the same time, Matthew begins to focus on them because these non-Jewish wise men do something so fascinating. They do something that we can all learn from. They're not, they're not in, in essence, from the line of, of the tribe of Judah. They're not Jewish people, and yet they respond to the Messiah in such a way. They respond to Jesus in such a way that all of us in this room should learn from that. You see, I want you to know that, that this week I have been stricken with a sense of awe of who Jesus is, and, and we should every day, but especially around Christmas. See, I, I'm afraid, and I want to tell you to be, I want to be real honest with you. I think that Jesus gets so crowded out. I, I think that the Christmas is such an incredible time of the year, and it's a lot of fun. How many of you had a little bit of fun this season? Let me see your hands. Oh, the rest of you, you need to go get some fun. I, I love the eggnog. It's got to be, I, I, I eat, I, I drink now, I don't drink the real eggnog because it's too fattening, you know what I'm talking about, so I do the almond eggnog, right? You know, and, and, and we decorate our house, and we have the stockings, and we have the tree, and, and I love singing jingle bells and, and all of that stuff. That's really nice, but, but I want to be honest with you. I, I've become a little jealous for Jesus this week. I want to be honest with you. I, I've become a little jealous of the glory of Jesus. And, that, and then I look at how these non-Jewish magi respond to the Messiah, and I think to myself, God, I pray that Bethlehem Assembly of God would respond to the Messiah the same way and more. 
that every one of us in this room, that, that we would be in awe of who Jesus is, that we would be in awe of the Messiah, that we wouldn't allow anything else in our life to become idols but that we would put it all in its proper place and we would recognize that Jesus needs to be the center of our affection, that Jesus needs to be everything in our life. He is God. He's the Messiah. He is the Holy One. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and how we need to respond in the way that the wise men responded, how, how they seek out truth, how they're determined to find Jesus, what they're willing to give up, how, what they do to find him, how they respond when they see Jesus, what they give to Jesus, and what do they do with that encounter. I think all of that helps us to understand how we need to respond. And so just for a few moments, I want to share with you what the Lord has shared with me about these wise men, number one, I want you to write this down, and I know that you've heard this a million times, but let me say it again. Wise men still seek Jesus with all their heart. Wise men still seek Jesus with all their heart. Notice their response. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born, the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, we often really miss this. In fact, we often see the wise men at the manger, but they weren't at the manger. I know, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that if you have a manger scene, I have a manger scene, we all have a manger scene, and the wise men are at the manger. I know that you're going to be tempted to take the wise men and put them in the attic and bring them out in about a year from now. What do I do with these wise men? Where do I put them in the manger scene? But the truth of the matter is, it wasn't a manger. It was mostly a cave, probably, because it was in somebody's house or at least in the back of the house. But, but not only that, but uh, it, it wasn't even that the wise men were at the manger. And how do we know that? Because when the Christ child was born, they saw a star and they were in Babylon. Now just think about that for a few moments. When they saw the star, they didn't just get up and say, I'm running to Bethlehem. They had to make plans. The first thing they needed to do is confirm the star. And so I suppose that when they saw the star, they all gathered together and said, whoa, that is a really special star. And they began to search the scriptures to confirm it. They're not going to waste their time. Their king is not going to let them just go without them really confirming that it's a special star. And then they have to make preparation to get all of these people over to Jerusalem. And so they've got to, they've got to get permission. And then after that, they've got to make all this preparation. And they've got to have these soldiers ready. And they've got to have an entourage. And they've got to make a, they've got to make a pitch to the king, you know, and say, look, we need to go. And this is the reason why we have to go. And, and some theologians believe that it took at least months and maybe even up to two years before they actually got to see the Messiah. And so it was a long process. And, you know, they, they could have just said, you know what, nice star, but you know what, I, we don't have time to go all the way there and, and do all the things that we have to do. What kind of a seeker were they? They were diligent seekers. They were determined seekers. They made sure that if they saw this special thing that God was doing, they weren't going to miss it. And I wonder how many Christians miss the special things of God in their life. I wonder how many Christians miss the special moments, the, the special Shekinah moments of God in their life because they're, too, they're way too busy with other things in their life that they can't stop to really realize God wants to speak to them. God wants to do a work in their life and God wants to change their life and God wants to bring something into their life but they miss the opportunity because they're not in the right place at the right time to see what God wants to do and they're not willing to to do whatever it takes to get to God. Come on, somebody say amen. Listen to me. The only way you and I will ever really know God, the only way we'll really hear God, the only way we'll see God, the only way we'll really experience God is when we decide that knowing God, that hearing God, that seeing God, that experiencing God is more important than anything else in our life. 
Listen to me, God is never found by the casual. I'm just telling you now, that's just the way it is. God is never found by the careless. God is never found by the carefree, the lazy, and the apathetic seeker. It will take a desire to know God, to experience God, to really understand and see God for ourselves. Jeremiah tells the people of Israel in Jeremiah chapter 29, then you will call upon me and will come and pray to me and I will listen to you. When you seek me, you will find me when you search with me, when you search for me with all of your heart. Then I will be found. Let me ask you a question today. What kind of seeker are you? Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 29 says, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Proverbs eight says, I love those who love me and those who seek me will find me. Listen to me, you're not gonna just bump into God. You're not gonna just casually find God. God actually, I want to tell you, God actually hides himself from some people. God hide himself from anyone. Because the truth is, he's looking for diligent seekers, those who really want to find him. You know, in fact, there's a couple of script, uh, stories in the Bible that help us to understand this concept of diligently finding and seeking Jesus. I mean, we know the story about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a short man. He was a tax collector. And the Bible says that when Jesus came to town, that Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus over the crowd because he was a short man. And so Zacchaeus climbed the tree and because he had to see Jesus. He did whatever it took to see Jesus. And friend, I want you to know today that Jesus wants you to see him. Jesus wants you to experience him. But you're going to have to be determined to find him. Come on, somebody say amen. Acts chapter 17, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your our own prophets have said or poets have said, listen to me, God is here this morning. He's not far from you. He's closer than you could ever imagine, but it will take a determination like the woman with the issue of blood to press through the crowds, to press through all the stuff that's pushing out, crowding out Jesus. Maybe it's even the holiday. It's all the festivities that are around us. Listen, after everything is wrapped up, after we've opened our gifts and after we've unpackaged everything and then wrapped it back up, after the lights are taken down, after the drinks are gone, after everything is gone, the only thing that will matter, the only thing that will last is Jesus. Come on, somebody. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what does it mean to seek God with all of our heart? It means that we make it a priority. The Bible says, seek God while he may be found. It means that we're determined, the woman with the issue of blood. It means we're desperate like blind Bartimaeus. And, and listen to me, these three wise or many wise men, because there weren't three, there were actually many. We, we, we often say there were three wise men because we're three gifts, but there are many wise men. They, it took them months to get to Jesus, maybe even years to get to Jesus. They had to go through the desert. They had to go through all kinds of things to get to Jesus, but they were wanting to see Jesus so desperately. They were determined to see Jesus, and they found Jesus because they sought Jesus with all their heart. Hebrews chapter 11 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who, everybody say with me, diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. And so what's keeping you today from really experiencing Jesus? Maybe it's just that you've been a casual seeker and today is the day where you say no more casual seeking of God. I want to know God. Number two, the wise men still worship Jesus with all their heart. The wise men left their homes. They traveled for months, 
maybe even years. And when they got to Jerusalem, they said this, we saw a star when it rose, and we have come to do one thing. We have come not to casually inquire about Jesus. We've not come just to make up our mind whether we're gonna worship Jesus or not. They said, we've come to do one thing. We've come to worship Jesus. Can you imagine how long it took, how hard it was to get to Jesus? And yet they came with a determination to worship Jesus. They didn't travel for months, even years, to get to, get to a Jesus just to be double-minded about their worship. But they came to do one thing, to worship the king. They knew he was the king. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew he was royalty. They knew he was majesty. They knew he was the long-awaited sovereign. And it was worth every step. It was worth every ounce of effort. It was worth all the sacrifice. It was worth all the stress and difficulty because Jesus was the king. Just one glimpse, just one touch, just one look at the living Savior. That's what they wanted. They wanted one pass. They wanted one moment. They wanted one minute. They wanted one moment to worship Jesus. Can you imagine that they just wanted that one moment to bring their gifts to Jesus? They knew they were going to leave. They knew they were going to leave Bethlehem. They knew they were going back to Babylon, but they just wanted that one glimpse. They wanted that one moment to be able to worship the Lord. They, they came to worship King Jesus. They came to worship the Almighty One. They came to worship the Alpha and Omega. They came to worship the author and perfecter of their faith. They came to worship the bread of life, the beloved Son of God, the bridegroom. They came to worship the chief cornerstone. They came to, to worship the deliverer. They came to, to worship the faithful one of Israel, the good shepherd, the great high priest, the head of the church, the great I am, the Emmanuel, the indescribable gift that Paul talks about, the judge of the world, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the lamb of God, the light of the world, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, they came to, to, to worship the Lord of all, the mediator, the Messiah, the mighty one, the one who sets us free, the one who gives us hope, the one who gives us peace, the one who's the true prophet, the one who's our redeemer, the risen Lord, the rock, the sacrificial lamb, the savior, the son of man, the son of the most high, the supreme creator of all, the resurrection and the life, the door, the way, the word, the true vine, the truth, the, victor, the victorious one. They came to, to worship the wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace they came to worship Jesus because they knew who he was I wonder today do you really know who Jesus is because if you really know who Jesus is you'd come to worship him hallelujah you'd live your whole life for one reason to worship the king hallelujah there would be a holy, reverential jealousy for your Jesus because you love him with all your heart. You see, he alone is worthy. It's really the Christmas story. My friend, Christmas is glorious. Why? Because, because of Jesus. Christmas is glorious because Jesus is still the reason for the season. Now I don't, I don't, I know I'm gonna get, I know, I know somebody's gonna get upset with me. I don't have nothing against Santa. I know somebody's gonna get upset at me. Santa's a nice man. Good old Saint Nick, who was a nice man, and I believe he really existed at one time, and he brought nice gifts to people. He was a nice man. But Santa can only bring me a little toy. Jesus brings me eternal life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Santa comes down the chimney. Jesus is coming from heaven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Santa just comes once a year and he gives me gifts if I'm naughty. He doesn't give me anything but coal. But listen, I've been naughty for a long time and the Son of God came and gave me life anyway. By his grace, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the reason for the season. Hallelujah. 
that long after Santa is in the North Pole and he's putting away his sleigh, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll walk through the fire with you and I'll be with you every step of the way. Glory to God. I got nothing, I got nothing against Santa. But Santa has nothing on Jesus. Nothing. Nothing on Jesus. It's about him. I wonder, do you really understand this morning? Can you really grasp? Can you really comprehend? The wise men travel for months, sacrifice so much, did whatever it took to do one thing, to worship the king. Are you just a Sunday worshiper? Are you a fair weather worshiper? Are you a casual worshiper? What is worship? To worship God is to fall down before him and to serve him. To worship is the act of declaring to God his worth, affirming who he is and what he has done and responding to him in praise and adoration and thanksgiving and awe. Someone once said, worship is, is ordered expression of love of God through the total person. Worship is human loving reaction to God's loving action. The creator acts, the creators or the creatures respond. To worship God is to ascribe to him the worth for which he is worthy. Someone said to worship God is to fall down before him and to serve him. Worship is the act of declaring to God his worth, affirming who he is and what he's done and responding to him in praise and adoration. Worship is a desire to know God, to stand in his presence, to meet with God, an expectation of God to dwell among his people. Worship is coming before God with expectancy to see his manifest presence. Worship is to revere and pay homage to God. The act of profound adoration to give God glory, do his name, to bow down before him, to fall at his feet, to be as a puppy at his master's feet, to turn toward and to kiss, lifting up our hands in absolute surrender, drawing near to God, blessing and ministering to him, to be in fear for awe, giving ourselves over to him in loving affection, and to do so in spirit and in honesty. True worship is being fully aware of God's glory and majesty and react and respond with total abandonment and complete dedication, focused adoration that turns into complete love and obedience to the true God who deserves all our affection and all our love and all our devotion. Listen to me. This Christmas, don't miss the opportunity to worship Jesus. Wise men still bring to Jesus gifts that he deserves and gifts that he really wants. Notice what it says in verse nine. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Sounds like the pillar of fire during the times when Israel was wandering in the desert. God will always lead you to his son, my friend. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed on, on coming to the house, not the manger, the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Have you ever asked yourself, what does Jesus want for his birthday? Christmas is the only birthday when everyone else is giving gifts and receiving gifts and the birthday boy doesn't get much, if anything. So let me ask you a question. What does Jesus want from you? What gift can you bring Jesus? What gift can you bring him every day? What gift can you bring Jesus so that it would please him? Well, we know that the scriptures say, Micah, what does the Lord want? He wants justice. 
He wants mercy. And he wants us to walk in humility before him. He wants justice. He wants us to live just. He wants us to be merciful and receive his mercy in our life. And he wants us to be in awe of who he is. It's the greatest gifts we can bring Jesus. What else can we bring Jesus this Christmas? Well, he tells us that the thing that makes him happy is that when we give to the poor, it's actually giving to him. That when, when, we, when we love one another, we're actually loving him, amen? So, so I want you to think this Christmas, what gift are you going to bring to Jesus? Maybe, maybe it's just being still. Maybe it's, it's not running all over the place, but taking some time to just be with him. That was the greatest gift that Mary could give Jesus. Martha thought it was cooking for Jesus, pasta fazul. Well, she was Jewish, it was matzah fazul for her. 26 years, still working that fazul into every sermon. Maybe the greatest gift you could give Jesus is you could stop and just worship him, spend time with him, acknowledge him as Lord. But I, I want you to notice the last thing, which is very powerful as the worship team comes and we prepare for communion this morning, is wise men also go a different way when they encounter the Savior. I want you to notice the Bible says they came and they worshiped the Lord and they, they brought him gifts. They, they brought him certain gifts. We'll talk about it in a second. But, but then the Bible says that having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They went a different way. Listen to me. When you encounter Jesus, when you humbly come before Jesus and truly worship him, you will be changed. Jesus comes to a woman who's sitting at a well she had come in the afternoon when no one else was there because she lived a shameful life. And the Bible says that Jesus came. He, walked, he went to the well. He went through Samaria. Jews don't pass through Samaria. That's, they, don't, they don't interact with Samaritans, but Jesus did because he knew there was one woman who needed her life to be changed. And Jesus sits at the well and begins to talk about what? He talks about worship. And she says, my ancestors worship on that mountain. My ancestors worship this way. And Jesus says, no, no, no. True worship comes when we recognize that God is worthy of worship and that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And that day Jesus spoke into this woman's life and he said, you've had five husbands. You've had failed relationships. You're at the end of yourself, but if you come to me, I'll give you, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. And that one encounter with Jesus was so profound that that woman walked away from that experience and told her whole town about Jesus. It's one of the only times in the Bible it says that one person went back and the whole town was converted. Can you imagine that? One woman's testimony changes a whole town. And I want you to know today that one encounter with Jesus can change your life forever. It happened to me. I grew up in the church all my life, in this church. But at 19, even though I was religious, even though I even had certain experiences with God growing up, until I was 19, I was not ready to seek Jesus with all my heart. He said, I will be found when you seek me with all my heart. And when I would find Jesus, I wouldn't truly worship him with all my heart. But at 19, I decided I'm going to seek God and worship him with all my heart. I'm going to live the rest of my life, every day of my life, to seek to worship the king. And every day I bring him my gift. I give him my gift of presence. I give him my presence because that's all he wants is me. He doesn't, he doesn't want 
my reading Bible, praying and all of that stuff, even though I do all of that, really wants, he wants me, he wants my heart. And I've given him my heart. And you know, the beautiful thing is when I was 19 years old, Christ did such a dramatic work in my life that I was changed. And now I walk a different road, hallelujah. I walk a different road. I'm not going back to Herod. I'm not going back to idolatry. I'm not going back to drugs and alcohol. I'm not, I'm not going back to the things that offered me false peace. The presence that the world offers me will only last a moment. The presence that Jesus offers me lasts me a lifetime. Hallelujah. And so as we prepare our hearts for communion and we pre prepare our hearts for a day. Beautiful day. There's nothing wrong. I, I love it, man. I'm telling you. Christmas Day, I'm going to be in my Christmas jabbies. I'll take a picture and put it on Facebook. And I, have my little, I have my little elf hat on. And we'll sing great Christmas songs. And I will gather around the tree. And I'll open up the story about Jesus. My Jesus. And I'll tell my kids, and they'll tell their kids that the real meaning of Christmas is a Savior, hallelujah, who was born. And they shall call him Emmanuel. God is with us, hallelujah. And if you've never met my Jesus, if you've never asked my Jesus to come into your heart today, this wonderful day, if you come to Jesus with your whole heart, he will meet you and you'll never be the same. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person in this room, Lord. I pray for every teenager, every young adult, God. Lord, I pray for every child. I pray for every adult in this place, Lord. God. I pray that you protect our hearts from running after things that can only be temporary at best. God, help us to come to the place in our life where we will do everything and anything it takes, Lord, to find Jesus. And Jesus, the only thing you're asking from us, Lord God, is that we come in humility with a hunger to know you, and you'll do the rest. Maybe you're here today, say, Pastor, I'm not certain that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. And I need to be forgiven of my sins, and I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And today, I'm surrendering myself to God for the rest of my life. Would you pray for me today, Pastor Steve? Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus today. Anybody in this room? Say, yes, God bless you for that hand. Anybody else? I want to give Jesus my life today. God bless you. Listen, after the service today, I see a couple of hands raised. There's going to be some folks that are going to be standing up front after we take communion, and we want to give you a free gift. And so just come on up and ask one of, we call them altar counselors, and they're going to give you a free gift so that you can start your journey of faith. Amen? Why don't we pray in this room all across this place is a, prayer of dedication before we go into communion today let's pray a prayer of dedication to the Lord repeat after me Lord Jesus thank you that you are the sole reason for Christmas the center the centerpiece salvation Lord teach me one day at a time how to bring to you the greatest gift I can give you. And that is my heart. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. Purify me. Cleanse me. Help me today by the power of your Spirit to live for the King. In Jesus' name, amen.